starting point for the other talks to come that will probably focus on some particular issues of conflict of laws, whereas I will try to give you a general overview of this interesting field of law and academic discipline and what it has to do with our work as Wikipedia editors. So when I submitted this talk earlier this year, I entitled it Which Law Applies to Wikipedia? Although I am the first to admit that this title is highly misleading and probably false, because the only answer to this question, which law applies to Wikipedia, would be all of them. <laughs> Depending on jurisdiction and um, the question of law, you are asking any law can apply to Wikipedia. And there's, the, as there's no universal rule that decides on the conflict of laws, but as all depends on national rule, rules on conflict of laws, there can even be multiple laws that would apply to Wikipedia. Thus, a much more accurate question would have been, which law applies to a certain aspect of a certain <laughs> media project, such as Wikipedia, in a certain legal system? Which would have been more accurate, but also a little less catchy. So I think we stick to our initial question, which law applies to Wikipedia, which I will discuss in two parts. First, I'm uh, going to try to give you a general overview of this interesting field, how is the applicable law determined in general, before we will have a look at some specific Wikipedia-related topics. Okay, so let's start, uh, start with conflict of laws. Conflict of laws is the academic field, the field of law, that is dedicated to the question of the applicable law to questions or issues of private law in international cases. Um, therefore, it is often uh, called private international law as well. And it has once been famously described as a dismal swamp filled with quaking quagmires and inhabited by learned and eccentric professors <laughs> who theorize about mysterious matters in a strange and incomprehensible jungle. The ordinary court or lawyer is quite lost when engulfed and entangled in it. And <laughs> although I have to admit this is true, I think it makes it all the more interesting to get just the basic principles of this field of law. Also, because um, it, is, it has become more and more important recently because almost every internet case today is an international case and therefore raises question of conflict of laws. So what I'm trying to give you is conflict of laws in a nutshell. <laughs> Now, let's start with the reason why this academic, complicated, complex discipline exists. And the reason is simple, because every state has its own legal system. For the sake of example, I've just picked uh, four states, the top four of the last World Cup, you might have noticed, <laughs> Germany, <laughs> Germany, Argentina, and Brazil. All of these states have a um, set of rules um, that is designed to contain an answer to any legal question that may arise. Okay, admittedly, uh, Germany has a few more rules than the others. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, um, any state has a, um, has a legal system, and this legal system contains an answer to any legal question in theory. So if there's a car accident in Germany, maybe two Germans crash after um, celebrating the World Cup, <laughs> then the uh, judge will be able to look into the law, into the German legal system, and find an answer to the question who has to pay for the damages. And the same is true for all of the states. Now, in every state, there's also a specific set of rules. This is called conflict of laws rules. And these rules are designed to um, give an answer to only one question, to the question of the applicable law in an international case in a case that involves some so-called foreign element, for example, if the parties have different nationalities or have their residents in different states, then the question arises, which law applies? Because a judge does not always apply his own law. In fact, the judge quite often has to apply a foreign law because his own conflict of laws rules tell them to apply a foreign law. Let's have a look at an example. If two Germans have a car crash, a car accident in the Netherlands, then the judge will have to take three steps before he can give an answer on the merits. He first has to identify the question of law, in our case, um, who has to pay for the damage. Then 
he will um, check his national procedural law in order to find out whether he has jurisdiction. In our case, he would have jurisdiction because the accident happened in the Netherlands. And in a third step, he would have to uh, look into the Netherlands, into the Dutch rules on the conflict of laws, to find out whether he can apply Dutch law to the case or whether he has to apply German law. And then only he can give an answer to the question of law that is uh, with to pay for the damages. And the same is true, once again, in every jurisdiction there is. Now, in our case, not only would the Dutch courts have jurisdiction, because it's a place of the accident, but also the German courts, because both parties are German. But both courts would apply the same law to the case, because the rule on conflict of laws is the same in both countries, and this rule tells the judge to apply the law of the parties if both parties have the residence in the same state. So both judges, regardless of the court you see, would apply German law to this case, which is interesting and I think um, it's not, uh, the, the common misconception is that a judge that has jurisdiction will apply his own law, but simply this is not true. <coughs> and, um, well, by the way, the reason why um, both uh, legal systems have the same rule on the conflict of laws is that today every European member state, every member state of the European Union has the same rule, both on jurisdiction and on the conflict of laws. Now, uh, in a very quick conclusion, how to identify the applicable law. There are three steps. The first step is to identify the question of law. The second step is to identify all countries whose courts may have jurisdiction. And the third step is to look into the rules on the conflict of laws in each of, each of these states in order to find the applicable law. Maybe I will uh, I have to illustrate this with a second example very quick. If a French Wikipedia buys a notebook from a Spanish Wikipedia at Wikimedia in London, <laughs> <laughs> then we have to take the same three steps um, if we want to know, for example, if the contract is valid. So first, uh, the question of law, is the contract valid? The courts of England and Wales would have jurisdiction because this is a place of performance of the contract. But also, the courts of France would have jurisdiction because um, uh, for, for claims against the French Wikipedia, and the courts of Spain would have jurisdiction for um, claims against the Spanish Wikipedia. But all of these courts, once again, would apply the same law. They would all rec be required to apply Spanish law to the case because the rule on the conflict of laws in all of these states, all of them are member states of the European Union, is to apply the law of the seller. Therefore, all of them would apply Spanish law, and maybe uh, what you can keep in mind is that uh, although several courts may have jurisdiction, in many cases they will actually apply the same law to the merits of the case. Now, after this very quick introduction to the basic principles of conflict of laws, we will have a look at Wikimedia projects, which is why you are here, I guess. <laughs> For the sake of this uh, presentation, I've just picked up uh, two legal questions which I consider to be particularly interesting in, in our context, and um, also because they give rise to either lawsuits or heated debate relatively regularly. So we will have a look at defamation um, to the applicable law uh, on defamation cases and at the applicable law in copyright cases. Now, jurisdiction in defamation cases is relatively broad because it is tort law um, and in many jurisdictions, the jurisdiction can be founded on the tort being committed within the jurisdiction, which um, regularly is understood as any state in which a text has been published. And some courts from different states even held that in an internet case, any state in which a homepage can be accessed is considered a state where the tort is committed. So jurisdiction is very broad and it gets even broader because there's a second rule which is uh, which you will often find in national um, legislation and this is that the courts of the state where the damage is sustained also have jurisdiction which allows a claimant in most cases to seize the courts of his own jurisdiction. So 
as Wikipedia editors, we have to uh, accept that we can be sued almost anywhere in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but this does not mean that any law in the world applies, because we've seen that although a court may have jurisdiction, it does not mean that he, uh, or the, the judges will apply the law of the state of the court. So, conflict of laws becomes very interesting. And it's even more interesting because the substantial laws on uh, defamation differ so much from one <coughs> jurisdiction to another because they are strongly influenced by constitutional principles such as freedom of speech or um, right to privacy, and these are understood very differently from one uh, state to another. Therefore, it is really crucial to know which law applies. But unfortunately, the diversity in substantial rules is also somewhat reflected by a certain diversity in rules of the conflict of laws. Because in some jurisdictions, the law of the place where the tort is committed is applied, and in other jurisdictions, it is the law of the place where the damage is sustained. And as both are really broad um, categories, it is very difficult to tell which law applies. <coughs> However, there is a third uh, rule which is applied in uh, a considerable number of jurisdictions. And this is to apply the law of the state with the closest connection to the case. And this rule exists, among others, in Germany, in the UK, and in the United States. And I think this is really good news for Wikipedia editors. Because although the content of Wikipedia can be accessed virtually from anywhere in the world, it is split up in 285 language words. And in my opinion, the law of the state with the closest connection to the case can only be of the state with the closest connection to the case can only be a state that is targeted by the language version of Wikipedia you are working on. <coughs> um, so, for example, if you upload um, or publish content about Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, um, which is allegedly defamatory, uh, to the Japanese Wikipedia then Mrs. Merkel may be able to seize a German court, according to the rules we've already seen, but most probably this court will not apply German law to the case. Instead, the court will be required to apply the law of the state of the closest connection to the case, and in my opinion, this would be Japanese law, to which you have hopefully obeyed. <laughs> no. Unfortunately, this is just my understanding um, of the law as a researcher, and we do not know whether courts would follow this reasoning, because although there have been some court decisions, especially in the last two years, there have been several court decisions, but all of them were in national cases. I'll show you what I mean. Um, there's one case of which I know in which a Wikipedia editor was sued um, by a Greek politician. It was a Greek Wikipedia editor, and the lawsuit was about content of the Greek Wikipedia, so the case was decided by a Greek court that applied Greek law to it. Nothing to learn from that. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is one thing because um, the claimant actually got a preliminary injunction. Um, and well, it's funny because we all know how useless um, this is. As long as content is accurate, no single the editor can prevent it from being published. And sure enough, the content is now available in nine other language versions. <laughs> <laughs> The claims could have learned something from the case, but we can't. Then we have several cases in which the Wikimedia Foundation was sued. There are three German cases where German claimant sued the Wikimedia Foundation over content of the German Wikipedia. They were decided by German courts that applied to German law. And then we have two Italian cases. One of um, them is only two weeks old, where um, the Wikimedia Foundation was sued by Italian politicians that um, over content of the Italian Wikipedia, of course, mm. and it was decided, that both cases were decided by the Court of Rome that um, applied Italian law to the case. So all, all the cases were won by the Wikimedia Foundation, by the way, so what we can take from them is that the foundation does a terrific job in defending freedom of speech. <laughs> both were <laughs> Now, 
I thought we would finally get such a case when the uh, Canadian musician Yank Berry sued, um, I think, 54 Wikipedia editors <laughs> over percent of the English Wikipedia, which would have been the perfect case to get an answer to this question. But unfortunately, the claim was withdrawn just I think, three weeks ago. So we still uh, we still don't know. But my practical advice would be to take special care about the laws of the states at which the language version you're working on is aimed. Second topic, because we don't have much time, is copyright. Ooh. Jurisdiction in copyright is again. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. ten minutes. That's good. Um, <laughs> jurisdiction in copyright cases again is very broad because copyright is also tort law. So we have the same rules applying in most states, and this is um, that both the cause of the place where the tort is committed and the um, the courts of the state where the damage is allegedly sustained will have jurisdiction as well, which once again allows a claimant to seize the courts of his own domicile as a most important practical application of this rule. So again, um, claims can be decided by courts anywhere in the world, and it becomes very, very interesting to know which law applies. Um, I think <coughs> it's even more interesting in copyright, actually, because um, copyright law tends to differ enormously from one country to another. If you've been here before the break, then you've already learned from the other presentations that there really are dramatic um, differences between copyright laws, between national copyright laws. Um, I plan to demonstrate this um, with a look at the US copyright law, but we've already learned a lot about um, US copyright law in the morning. So I will be very quick, but one thing which is interesting in my opinion is that we cannot even say which copyright law is the better one. Because in some regards, a copyright law may be very lenient, and in another regard, it may be very strict. So for example, US copyright law has a really great approach on fair use, which is um, understood as a much broader principle than in any other jurisdiction in the world, maybe except for Israel. But um, fair use is really great in US copyright law, but on the other hand, you have a really limited approach on freedom of panorama, which is limited to buildings in the United States, whereas it is a general principle in many other copyright laws. So you cannot really say which copyright law is the best, and therefore it is very interesting to know which copyright law applies to, for example, Wikimedia Commons. Now, the good news is there really is just one rule that is almost universally applied in any state in the world, which is the Lex Loci Protectionist Rule. The bad news is this rule is really, really friendly to copyright holders because it means to apply the law of the place where the protection is claimed, which, as we've seen, is understood very broadly because it is the place, you can claim protection at any place where an infringement takes place. And this means more or less in any state in the world, if you have a, a, a web page like Wikimedia Commons, which is accessible from any place in the world. Therefore, this Lex, protect, uh, Lex Loki Protectionist Principle really is a bad thing for our understanding as Wikipedia editors and activists. Um, especially because it means that um, theoretically the law of any state applies and theoretically we have to confirm to even the strictest copyright law in the world before we can upload content. Which of course even judges understand is highly impractical and very unrealistic as a standard. So there are certain exceptions that have been developed for example, um, some courts uh, today require that the infringement in the state uh, in question has to be a certain, to have a certain economic impact, and in other states it is required that the state, um, the copyright law of which um, should apply, has to be targeted by the person who infringes the copyright. But these exceptions may allow us to disregard the copyright laws of Iceland or Nipah, but most probably they don't allow us to disregard the copyright laws of the United States. Because it will be very difficult 
for a defendant to prove that the United States were not targeted or that there's no economic impact in the United States if content is accessible in the United States. As soon as content is accessible in the United States, there will be infringement and it will be possible to demand the application of the US copyright law. For example, or if we have a particular look at Wikimedia Commons again, then there's not only the fact that the content can be accessed from the United States, there's also a second factor which makes the US copyright law even more prominent in these cases, and this is that the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the only person that can effectively remove content from the Wikimedia Commons servers, is based in the United States. But this is a second factor. The first, that the com content is accessible in the United States, would be sufficient to make the US law applicable. So therefore, I think the policy on uh, media comments is totally reasonable as long as this Lex Loci Protectionist principle exists and the official policy is, you know, that content has to be free both under the laws of the place of its origin and under the laws of the United States. Nevertheless, there is a heated debate um, about both whether this assessment is uh, right in the first place and then uh, secondly, what we can do to avoid the application of US copyright law. And um, although I personally am of the opinion that it is totally reasonable to um, take special care about the United States law, there are some propositions on how to avoid the application of US copyright law and I will very quickly comment on them because um, I think they are based on misconceptions. That's one proposition to move the servers outside of the United States. And hopefully, you've already seen that this simply can't work. It is feasible, practically, but it won't change the thing. Because the applicable law simply does not depend on the location of the servers. It depends on where protection is claimed, and if there's an infringement in the United States, then um, the US law is applicable, regardless where the servers are positioned. So this won't change the thing. And then there's a second proposition, which is a bit more sophisticated, um, which is to give control over the servers to an entity that is not registered in the United States, for example, a national chapter, which in some cases would avoid US jurisdiction, but as we've seen, this would not avoid um, the application of the US law, because still there will be um, substantial infringement in the United States as long as the content is accessible in, within the United States. So this won't work either if, if our aim is to avoid US copyright law. In my opinion, there simply is no way to escape the US copyright law. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one thing we should consider, and th th uh, this is uh, whether there are ways to um, avoid copyright infringement in the United States. And I think there is one way which we should discuss and consider. I don't say, I say we should do it, but we should discuss it. And this is to block access to certain content from the United States if we really want to avoid the application of US copyright law, because pretty much uh, this is pretty much the only thing we can do. And this is basically what YouTube does with uh, content that is copyrighted in one state and not in another. And um, although it sucks as a German, you cannot uh, access <laughs> legally 50% of YouTube's com uh, content from a legal point of view, this works. So we should consider this. Also, it would have uh, another advantage, and this is it would mount the pressure on the US lawmakers to decide on a better uh, copyright law eventually, which would also allow us to stop worrying about the applicable law which would be excellent, but as long as we have to worry about the applicable law, I hope I have provided you with an interesting overview of this field. And, um, well, although I have to admit that the only answer to the initial question, which law applies to Wikipedia, um, that I can give you is the answer you will get from any lawyer. It depends. <laughs>
big picture, as you can see, uh, we receive a very low number of takedown demands when compared to other companies. <laughs> Just to give you a little bit of an idea, uh, this is a comparison of how many notices the Wikimedia Foundation and Twitter receive in one full year versus how many URL-only takedown notices Google receives on the average of one day in June of 2014. <laughs> <laughs> Our low figure is the result of Wikimedia and volunteer communities uh, ability to identify and proactively remove potential legal problems before those potential legal problems could turn into formal legal demands and litigation. After all, the, oh, yeah, sorry. After all, the Wikimedia movement is um, here to provide free and legal content. So with that, let's get into a couple of examples. Yeah, if I can go back and just point out one thing about this slide. The only way to get things taken down in Google is to go through Google, right? So that's why our number is so big. And you guys are doing a good job of keeping Wikipedia legal, which is why we receive so few points. I just want to make sure that's clear. Like we're, we're doing that very small number at the bottom is because people are doing a good job keeping so one of the first we received is a very controversial topic on Wikipedia, um, stadium mustard. So we received a takedown notice uh, from the Davis Food Company uh, as an evolving dispute between the Davis Food Company and Joe Bateman Foods, Inc. Uh, over the Wikipedia page, stadium mustard. So stadium mustard is a registered trademark uh, of the company on the left, the Cleveland-based Davis Food Company. Uh, the mustard on the right, the Burpin Malt Park mustard, is made by a rival Cleveland area uh, mustard company. And they're very heavy competitors. They both uh, have claims to the, the phrase stadium mustard. Uh, this dispute is ongoing, it's been documented online, and someone had inserted into their Wikipedia page that both of these mustards are called stadium mustard. Cited to reliable, neutral, third party sources, like always. <laughs> So, the Davis Food Company, which produces stadium mustard, sent us a takedown notice in April 2013, demanding us to remove certain statements from the Wikipedia article that they believed were false and violated their trademark. The English Wikipedia article notes that stadium mustard is not just a trademark, but also a generic term in the Cleveland area used to refer to both stadium mustards. And the Davis Food Company objected to the sentence, claiming the stadium mustard was not a generic term referring to both companies' mustards, and the sentence amounted to a trademark violation. But the article in question did not present any instances of trademark infringement. It was clear that Davis Food Company trademarked the name Stadium Mustard and that there was a dispute between Davis Food Company and Burton's Ballpark about which company was the original Stadium Mustard. Neither WMF nor the Wikipedia community had done anything that creates consumer confusion, which is the standard for trademark violation, between the two products. It's only explained that the basis of the dispute <coughs> is an educational encyclopedic description of a dispute between uh, some very angry mustard. <laughs> <laughs> so we told the Davis Food Company to go through the process to set up a Wikipedia volunteer community to request a sentence be reviewed for accuracy. After a discussion among the community and subsequent edits, the language was not changed. Stadium mustard was re was referred to with its reliable source, and uh, the language is up to this day. <laughs> Monkey could have copyrights. The monkey did not know he was. 
was making a photograph, so he did not make any decisions as to how to photograph you. So <laughs> very <laughs> In, tw in June of 2014, we received a takedown notice from a request from the Latvian National Museum of Art concerning 46 images of Eastern European paintings that were available online for the Google Art Project. A Commons user had taken these images from the Google Art Project or elsewhere and uploaded them to Commons, and they were apparently being circulated online by several different groups. The museum wanted the images taken down, claiming that they had reached an agreement with Google about how these images were being displayed. The foundation did not intervene, however, because the paintings in question were in the public domain and rightfully on commons. We suggested that the museum address any contractual disputes with Google directly, and suggested the museum go through the normal community processes on commons, to request a courtesy deletion of the files if they think that's appropriate. After a discussion on commons, however, the community decided that the image should remain up uh, because they were in the public domain. So just to be clear, violating an agreement between including the terms of use of a website can have legal consequences. But on the other hand, when a work is under the public domain, reproduction of that work is no longer protected by copyright law. It's questionable how much someone may use contract rights to extend the reach of expired copyrights. Our next example. Um not actually either of these pictures uh, because we did have to comply with the request and I'll get into the why in a minute. But essentially, shortly after Nelson Mandela passed away, we received a takedown notice for a photo on commons of then Senator Barack Obama and his first meeting with Nelson Mandela. Because the photographer David Katz was an employee of, uh, for uh, the US Senator at the time, uh, the photo was believed to be in the public domain. Generally, a work is considered a work of the U.S. government um, and therefore not subject to copyright protection where the work is prepared by an officer or employee of the U.S. government as part of that person's official duties. Um, however, we did realize that Katz was an employee of the government at the time, but however, Katz argued that the photo was not part of his official duties um, and therefore was not in the public domain. We conducted a pretty exhaustive investigation into the matter before deciding whether or not to remove the image. We found sources that suggested Mr. Katz was acting as an aide um, and a driver rather than an official photographer at the time the photo was taken. Um, additionally, Mr. Katz's attorneys uh, told us that the photography was not part of his official duties as Senate employee, that Mr. Katz used his own camera at the time to take the photograph, that Mr. Katz processed the photo in his personal time, and we were also forwarded a message from the then chief of staff for then Senator Barack Obama attesting that Mr. Katz's official duties did not include photography. Because of all of this evidence, we made the hard decision to take down the photograph um, since it was not one of his official duties. <laughs> So in February 2013, a French publisher sent us a DMCA takedown notice for three novels on Wikisource. Two were French novels, and one was a French translation of H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man. The request was unusual. All three works were, were that the company was claiming copyright over had long since been in the public domain. The first work was first published in 1959, and the author died in 1559, and the author died in 1549. <laughs> the second work, uh, was sourced from a scanned copy of an 1889 edition of the book, which was originally published in 1879. The, the author had died in 1885. The Invisible Man was published in 1897, <coughs> and the author died in 1946. If the French translation of this work on Wikisource was published af after 1923, the version that was transferred on Wikisource was published after 1923, the publisher company may have had a valid DMCA claim, but they did not uh, make that claim to us. <coughs> We gave our analysis to the publishing company, and we looked for further information regarding the Invisible Man translation. For example, the documents showing that the translation was published after 1923, and that the company had proper rights to it, so that we could possibly move forward with the DMCA notice. However, the company promptly decided to withdraw its DMCA notice. We never heard from them again. <laughs> <laughs> Foundation was contacted by the DCRI, a French intelligence 
agency. The DCRI claimed that an article in French Wikipedia about a French military base is seen here. The DCRI demanded removal of the article in its entirety without any further substantive explanation. Now, to be clear, we take allegations of national security threats <coughs> very seriously, but when we really read the article, it really wasn't apparent um, from the article itself what was classified. Um, so we asked. The <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 so DCRI did not appreciate that. <laughs> We kept looking and we realized that almost all of the information in the article was cited to publicly available sources, specifically a detailed video tour of the station, <laughs> <laughs> military station uh, for local news, and that video is still up to the best of my knowledge. Um, additionally, the, the page was created in July of 2009 and had been continuously available and edited ever since. We couldn't for the life of us understand why it was a sudden <coughs> rush to take it down. Um, so again, we asked. Um, <laughs> not so much with answers. Uh, mm -hmm. So unfortunately, the DCRA refused to provide any specific information and reaffirmed their demand um, that the entire article be deleted. So we were forced to refuse, pending receipt of any more information if they were willing to talk. We thought that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> a few weeks later, we discovered the DCRI contacted a volunteer SysOp who lived in France. The SysOp was not responsible for the hosting of the information. He had no role in the creation or editing of the article and was not part of the Wikimedia Foundation. As we understand it, the SysOp attempted to explain all of this um, and his limited role as a volunteer and tried to direct them back to the foundation. But given that they had tried that route already without much success, um, they didn't accept this answer. And they insisted that the SysOp delete uh, the entire article using his administrative rights or face serious and immediate repercussions. Under the shadow of these threats, the SysOp understandably uh, removed the article. But of course, it's Wikipedia. So <laughs> the article was substantively, uh, subsequently reinstated by another member of the community almost immediately. Um, we defended the user involved and fought to keep the content up um, on French Wikipedia. Uh, and there was a little bit of a stress and effect there. Uh, <laughs> the article remains up today and is one of the most read articles of French Wikipedia. <laughs>
resurfaced in the 1970s, and some believe that it would put an end to the decades-old controversy over whether Babe Ruth really called uh, the Pitbull home run against the Chicago Cubs in the 1932 World Series. This past, past March, um, the owner of the film's copyright sent us a DMCA takedown request regarding the still image that you see here um, as it was being used on English Wikipedia. We conducted uh, <coughs> an investigation about it, and although the image is still under copyright, uh, we declined to remove the image on the basis of fair use, citing the photograph's extraordinary value in illustrating the famous moment in history um, and the educational purpose in its inclusion in the Wikipedia article that it served.
explaining the principles of uh, uh, private international law, which is very difficult to explain. So, if he comes back, tell him that again. Um, this is actually the third deal I'm giving this lecture. It's not the same lecture, because otherwise I would have sent you to the uh, YouTube of the previous deals and see the previous talks. But I did expect you to see the previous lectures, take notes, and therefore I'm not repeating stuff I already said before. Um, this lecture is um, not legal. It is based on legal stuff. I know it's in this thread, but as Ed said in his opening, this is actually a social machine lecture. There is more to the uh, copyright fights on the commons than just copyright law. There's lots of politics, politics involved, lots of power plays involved, and I actually want to discuss these issues and how they are affected by copyright or how copyright is actually used in this power plays. Just for my um, benefit, how many people here are commons admins? Okay, can you all sit in the back of the room? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, also, uh, this, I'm actually going to detail what happened in the past six months over several images in the commons. Because the arguments were so complicated and thrown over so many pages, I simplified the story and put it in order to make it easier to understand. Some events actually happened way before other events in the way that I'm describing them, but that's just to make things a bit simpler. First of all, you already know what Commons is. If you don't, you missed three lectures, four lectures ago. It is a repository, an old picture, an old uh, screenshot. Um, is it really a database to which anybody can contribute? That's a pretty big question. Is it a database of freely usable main media? Uh, this is from the description of Commons in the Commons. It's claiming to be a repository of freely licensed educational media contents. Not only images, also sound and video, much, much less, of course, than images. It has two purposes, which, in my opinion, are clashing, and actually may not coincide. First of all is the one already listed, to make available public domain freely licensed educational media content to all. And the second, which is the original purpose of the commons, much like uh, Wiki does today, to save space. If you have one picture on 287 Wikipedias, why hold it 287 times? Why not hold it just in one place and have all the Wikipedias go to the servers and use the same image? It is easier to search the data and it is easier to connect between Wikipedias and translate articles. So it is also easier for the foundation to handle copyright problems because you can delete the image just once, you don't have to do it 287 times, and actually you have a bot that goes around deleting stuff after it's deleted in the commons. Um, what I'm arguing is that these two purposes cannot coincide, they're actually contradicting, and actually what we need to do at this point of time is decide which one of the two is more important to us. Um, taking into consideration that usually people don't go into Google searching for image. They go into Google searching for data. They go to Wikipedia finding that data. And the images are just there on the way. Sometimes at the bottom of the article, you would have a link to other images that are on, on Commons. But basically, you want the images to illustrate the data in Wikipedia. The second one is the original intentions of most users when they upload images to Commons. Not the first one. Um, the problem already stated, but I'm repeating it, that's actually the downside of being the third of the six previous talks on the same subject. We don't know what people actually talked about when you did the presentation, so I guessed a bit, but there are some repeating slides. It is an international project, not a US project. Yes, I know, the US law applies all the time, as Tobias detailed very elaborately. Um, therefore, we must have the US law and the country of origin work deciding that the image is free. All other countries' laws do apply, but as uh, Toby stated, the US law is the relevant one. And then, all have breaks loose. Yeah. Um, already mentioned is the Uruguay Act, section 415, taking many free art, artworks, um, music, paintings, texts, which are free all over the world, except in one country, the United States, because of this law. And for some odd reason, it is not unconstitutional. That's the Golan Revolver Claim. Uh, if you shall leave the room. 
so they cannot contradict me when I'm wrong. Yes, it's good. Yes, it's good. Um, and then the, that's what I just mentioned. The court said that it's okay that these works are copyrighted in the United States, even though they are not copyrighted anywhere else, including the country of origin where the work was created. Um, we need to remember that copyright laws are actually English invention in the late 18th century, the way they are held today around the world. Um, there are contact between the state, the copyright holder, and the general public, giving the copyright holder some rights which expire, like a patent. A patent is for 15 years. Copyright, lifetime plus 70 usually, according to the Berne Convention. But it's a contract. And when you enter into a contract, you have some expectations. When, if, when a, an artist enters into a copyright contract with the state, and he knows that copyrights are for 30 years, and then after a while it's extended in other countries, he did not have that expectation in advance. And it may be argued that his intention when he did the artwork was for only the shorter period, the shorter copyright term, which also appears in the Berne Convention, the shorter term rule. So around the world, the shorter term applies and not uh, the longer term. Now let me go into the person in the story. This is Hannah, nice uh, elderly um, pensioner. She has two nice grandsons. Over her names, she's going to be in with me. She has other grandsons as well. She is an archaeologist, she likes to dig a lot. She's also a valued editor, contributor to Commons and the Hidden Wikipedia. She has plenty of time. She monitors about 30, 40,000 articles daily and many other pictures. One thing, she does know English very well. She does know English, but not that well. Then one day she found out that this picture was deleted. This is an Israeli soldier, picture from 1956. It was very useful. This is from here in Wikipedia. You can see, you know, I know you cannot read Hebrew, but you can see all the instances in which this picture is used. The longer ones are its picture of the day. It's actually the picture of the day on the Israeli Memorial Day. So it's every year going to be a picture of the day one time on the main page of Hebrew Wikipedia. And then it was deleted by a commons admin saying now, during according to the Uruguay Act, any image taken before a certain year should be deleted. Just a brief introduction. In Israel, copyright law is 50 years. So if the image was taken in 1956, it is in the public domain in 2007. Uh, of course, according to the US law, everything taken before 1946 is copyrighted. For at least 70 more years, I think. This made the Israelis really angry. We need to understand why. This is uh, a picture from a blog page of a woman called uh, Sima. She is a librarian. She did this, actually, this blog page in protest of the Uruguay Act. These are images that were actually discussed, the deletion of which was discussed in the Commons. I know probably you don't know these images, but um, for Israelis, they are very iconic. The one on the lower right is the Declaration of Independence. The bigger one in the middle, it's raising of the Israeli flag ending uh, the Israeli independence war. It's like raising the flag in Iwo Jima. It's very common, very, very important to Israelis. You also need to remember that the state of Israel was created in 1948, which means no Israeli picture is out of copyright, none whatsoever. Everything uploaded by Israelis should be deleted from commons unless they agree to a CC BY, which is smaller amount. All the glam initiatives cannot take place. All the public images of the government cannot be used. And as we have a short, a very short term rules, we have many government images which may be used and are on commons. Because we are in England, I want to try and illustrate this with an example. I think as a British <coughs> picture, it's an English Wikipedia, it's almost on 287 Wikipedias. Imagine that more a uh, US law would decide that this specific image is copyrighted and should be deleted for the next 70 years. How would the British people react? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, we uh, approach the state. The Israeli uh, government, the foreign office, the Ministry of Justice, was in charge of legislation and asked their opinion about it. They were very uh, straightforward. They agreed to write a letter to the Wikimedia Foundation, an open letter, saying that whatever in the public domain and is owned by the state, actually there was an even broader letter, according to the Israeli law, whatever in the public domain remains in the public.
public domain. So um, basically, if we go back to the nice chart that we had beforehand, the first section was always the claimant, the law of the claimant. The Israeli government said that according to Israeli law, they could not file a claim in any jurisdiction saying that they have copyright because they agreed that it's in the, image in the public domain. Um, for some odd reason, this did not convince anybody on the commons. <laughs> um, Hannah, who was in charge of the discussion, being a very heated uh, person with a lot of time on her hand, <laughs> uh, digging is usually done in the summer, so she had all winter to discuss this on the commons, <laughs> um, asked for help in Hebrew Wikipedia. She wrote her arguments in Hebrew and said, can anybody translate it to English and put it in the commons talk page in a way that they can understand me? And she was blocked for cross-posting, oh. oh. which, uh, of course, upsetted her very much. She did um, want me to mention that after she appealed the blog, she was released. So eventually, she now can post comments on the comments. But it's not a nice thing to do for somebody who is a valuable contributor and has uploaded tens of thousands to images to comments and actually knows the rules very well. Uh, and then what happened? Again, I'm jumping a bit between the time period. But the block and the deletion and the ignoring of the government uh, letter, which is very, very difficult to obtain, very few governments would agree to write a letter saying, we promise that we will never sue somebody for something anywhere in the world. <laughs> it's something governments don't tend to do. <laughs> and we managed to get that letter, actually. So, <laughs> Hannah managed to get that letter. So, uh, and it's in the chairperson of the media there. So uh, this started a heated discussion in the internal of the uh, Wikimedia <laughs> is a list. I suggested to file, file a personal claim against the Wikimedia Foundation for this amount. <laughs> I, <can't laughs> that. I actually think that I can support the claim and it has jurisdictions and uh, right proper Lex Locke in the Israeli court. I think I would win the claim, which would give me the ownership of Wikipedia. <laughs> um, other people rejected the idea, but um, I still might use it one day. The, another idea that was actually got a lot of merit was, okay, this is what happens on the commons. They're going to delete all our pictures. Let's be preemptive pre about it. Let's delete all the pictures ourselves and just move them to Wikipedia. Well, they cannot be deleted because no Hebrew Wikipedia system would delete these pictures. Um, if you're thinking this is crazy, this is a page from Hebrew Wikipedia. I'm going to translate for you. Yeah. If, if this is tabs. I'm actually displaying the last tab that you can't see the heading. The first tab is images that are about to be deleted in commons. The second one is images that are deleted in commons, then brought back. I will explain it in a minute. And then deleted again and brought back again. These are ones that were deleted, brought back, deleted, and not brought again. And these are ones that were deleted and not brought back and are now in Hebrew Wikipedia. They were uploaded here. Um, most of this image has also been uploaded to the English and French Wikipedia. I'm not sure about the German. So as if we are considering the um, troubles the Wikimedia Foundation can face in, uh, if a loose lawsuit is brought, the deletion of the pictures from the commons didn't do anything because it's now this picture exists in several other Wikipedias, which means that the owner of the picture, we need to send not one DMCA notice, but four DMCA notice, four times more work for Michelle, she might be the bigger stuff, but the, the risk for the foundation is four times as great, because now instead of one copyright breach, we have several copyright breach per picture. So whoever deleted the picture in the commons, thinking perhaps that he's doing a good service for the foundation, um, actually did the other way, uh, made the main work of matters worse. Uh, we had the uh, young part uh, sitting in our office in Israel, very small office, as you can see. That's Jan Bart. It's everybody surrounding him. Um, there is an official view of the foundation of the legal staff that moving the server outside the United States is not a good idea. Um, I'll be explained why, because the law remains the US law. And actually, in other countries, you have worst uh, freedom of speech laws and sometimes worst, worst uh, defamation laws. Uh, but when he was sitting alone in the middle of this circle of angry Wikipedians, he had to admit that if no solution is found, servers would have to be moved outside the United States and owned by a different entity. Um, I think both Toby and uh, Michelle and uh, 
actually I don't remember but there was so many talks about this today, explain why this shouldn't work, but it could work. Um, basically, if you leave the survey in the United States and they can still be owned by the commons, the important thing is the place where the um, bridge is done. And the bridge is done on the screen when we view the image. If you cannot view the image, there is no copyright breach or there is no defamation. So if, uh, for example, this was discussed last year, the Apple picture got a DMCA notice, it's a statue in Jerusalem, we have no, we have freedom panorama, there's no copyright over statues in Israel, so all statues can be taken if they're on public places permanently. Um, all these statues that you see in these pictures cannot be copyrighted in Israel, but they are copyrighted where the artists live. If this specific image gets a DMCA notice, and then what we do is make it available worldwide right, in all Wikipedias, except one, the one in the US, then according to US law, it could be protected, but there's no breach because nobody can see the picture. And worldwide, it is not protected because of the Berne Convention, and there's no problem in seeing the picture because, again, there's no breach of copyright. So we can leave the servers in the US and owned by the foundation of the move them out of the United States and owned by one of the chapters. Once the image is hidden in the US, there is no reason to apply the US law. And then I go back to the moving the pictures. What we are doing today in the Commons um, is doing only the first bit, making the images really available according to the US law. We are not doing the second bit. We are not using the, the Commons as a repository for image for all Wikipedia's. Um, one of the things that I was debating in raising what we need to understand, um, no, I'll, I'll get to that. Because the communities couldn't actually reach an agreement, and this is my point, we, are, we got to a position where we have clashing communities. We have some commons admin, not all of them, because commons admin live worldwide and have very different opinions on how we should handle this conflict. We got to a point where several chapters has issued a formal letter to the Wikimedia Board of Trustees telling them that we cannot continue working under these conditions, we cannot do glam work, all black initiatives have stopped. I was a Wikipedia in resident in the National Library of Israel and I have advised the National Library to stop uploading images to Commons and told them that it's pointless because the Commons, all the images will be deleted. And, uh, and actually for a while they did. Uh, eventually I left the National Library and we have a new Wikipedia resident who started uploading it again. But most glam uploading has stopped. Um, this letter was later joined by several other chapters telling the foundation that uh, if this environment of deletion of images continues, servers will have to be moved out. And each of these languages is going to start its own servers allowing images to be shown from their servers only on their Wikipedia or which other, other Wikipedia would want to join them, creating, in fact, a web of servers out in, outside the United States showing these images to some Wikipedias. And this is not really the purpose of the movement, showing some of the knowledge to some of the people in the world. <laughs> um, and the odd thing is that in my, the way I see it, there is no really a legal problem here. This is only a community problem. Legally, there is no problem. Um, Michelle and Stephen said that we have so few takedown notices because of the community work. It is partly true. And also, when I sit on the Commons and I see this image of an American actor just uploaded with a large copyright logo somewhere on it, I move it, I move it, move it for a deletion vote because it's obvious this is not somebody just Googled the picture, put it in Commons. This is not a free picture. But for most historical pictures, this is the issue or glam picture or artwork. It's not the zealotness of the Wikipedia uh, admins that protect the foundation. It's the fact that there is really no copyright problem. Um, and it is the Wikimedia Foundation legal staff that tell us not to worry about this. We have already mentioned the uh, DMCA. Um, I, I will, as it was explained, I will make it simple. You have a plaintiff, he sees something on Commons, he sends a letter uh, to the foundation telling him this picture is infringement of copyright or defamation, please take it down. <coughs> the foundation checks who uploaded the pictures, sends in a letter. Is this your copyright or is the plaintiff right? Do you oppose to the deletion of the image or would you allow it? 
This causes another problem because, as I've shown last year, many times the uploader does not speak English well and cannot even understand the letter of the foundation, which happened several times, as with the Apple picture. Um, and until he finds somebody who translates from English to a language he understands, he realizes that he would never be able to draft a letter back saying that there's no copyright problem and he just gives up and the picture is deleted. But what the DMCA allows us is that the foundation is safe from prosecution and if the uploader says, I am the copyright holder, the, the foundation is out of the picture. The plaintiff may sue the uploader and they can continue amongst the, themselves to argue who actually has the copyright. Um, it could be argued, by the way, that if a picture is out of copyright in one country, for example, I mentioned that in Israel it's 50 years in some occurrences, after 50 years, what happens to the copyright? Either it evaporates, so it ceases to exist, or as we use the term, pu the term public domain, uh, the fact is that everybody in the public in that country has equal rights to that copyright. Uh, I know it sounds weird, but actually it can happen even in land law, uh, that many people have the same right to the same piece of land. It is common property, equally shared by everybody else. Which means that if it's in the public domain in Israel, the uploaders of the picture and the plaintiff may have equal rights, according to the Israeli law, equal copyright rights. And if he decided to publish it and he is opposing, they have equal rights and one cannot actually sue the other, even if that one is the creator of the image. But if that is the case, the plaintiff, what the foundation tells us, he must have, he must be the copyright owner. Um, and here it is, I, I'm saying something that it was difficult for me to check, um, but it is the feeling among many people in the community that most of the deletions of these pictures in the comments was done not in good faith, but as part of power plays between not means or for political reasons if we look at the specific pictures that are targeted. It happened in many countries, and the copyright uh, arguments, or the, DM, the decide, decision to take down the picture was done. There were no DMCA notices, that's the important thing. Pictures are deleted according to the Europe by Ed, just because they, are, they may or may not be breaching of the image. Um, if I have time, we give example, or if we want, uh, later on. But the legal opinion, um, as is, uh, was seen, seen uh, the, let, let me just straighten the story a bit. After the public letter, the foundation asked for a legal opinion, and eventually the board of trustees issued a statement saying that the pictures, images, or files will be deleted from the commons only if there is a valid DMCA notice. It's not enough that one of the admins say, I know that all of these pictures from Israel are now not only Israel, Cyprus, India, uh, Argentina, Chile, Spain, all of these pictures are now copyrighted in the US. You must have the DMCA notice before you start deleting according to the Uruguay. I want to emphasize this. Valid DMCA, take a notice. It's not enough that an admin decides all of these pictures should be deleted now. Um, because of this uh, official statement, something that never before happened in, in the Commons actually took place. There was a vote to return pictures that were originally deleted. <laughs> and not one picture, really the discussions are per picture. This was a massive vote. All Uruguay images deleted will be returned because there was never a DNC notice. There was a huge consensus in this uh, decision some opposed it, but there was a huge amount of people supporting it, and most of the images were restored, and then deleted again. By the same guys who really deleted them in the first place. And then restored again, and then deleted again. <laughs> and for some pictures it happened the third and the fourth time. That's why you saw the page in Wikipedia with the repeats. Uh, is this still a problem? Yes. Some of the deletion discussion and the recovery discussion and the votes and the argument are still on as we speak now. Uh, some of the, uh, I think it's yesterday, some of them can see the discussion and they are still on. Again, this is not a legal problem. This is a community clash problem. And I need to ask you, what are the deletionists, the deletors, the people who do this actually protecting? Are they, are they protecting the foundation? Not really. 
legal staff themselves says this is not a valid DMCA notice. There's no copyright issue here. The copyright owner in the image, images from Israel, the state of Israel, have a letter saying we waive all copyright. We are saying these images are in the public domain. So it's actually a community problem. Um, I, I, it's not only me saying this. I got some emails that went through uh, media analysts. I don't know who is this person, but this is what he said. Uh, it's a problem between several commons have been arguing, and I'm not putting blames here. We should leave the lawyering work to the lawyers. And if the lawyers give us an opinion, don't worry, we can handle this. And as you have seen the last uh, lecture, they're doing a really good job at handling this, so they should get... Uh, no? The lawyers? Okay. Not, yes, not 
you, not you. Is there another question? Only one coffee, tea. Uh, no, okay. Yes. Also, in between a question and a comment. Because on comments, uh, we respect uh, official work uh, rules in the US and in Germany, of course, because official work is PD in Germany as well, and that is uh, respected on comments. So this letter from the Israeli government is on comments. Now. Is it? Yeah. On but on actually, comments. the letter. Why? Why can't we respect that as well? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, that person uh, tried to delete the letter because the letter is not uh, here the common license. It is copyrighted <laughs> by the government. <laughs> <laughs> And it doesn't even have to be our comment, but it yeah, exists. We move, we move the letter to the meta. Official letter by the for the same reasons, because the meta insists on having only Creative Commons articles yeah. or public domain and not a uh, copyrighted letter. And now the letter is in the Wikipedia world, which well, so nobody can read. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs>